essentially we're looking at the gospel of Mark and thinking of it as a manual for civil disobedience. So what you might find helpful um, is to think about what your question is as you're listening today. So you might be thinking, can I use this gospel as a manual for what I do in Christian climate action or in Extinction Rebellion or in Just Stop Oil? Uh, if so, how? You might be thinking, do I need to change how I live and act? And if so, how? You might be thinking, how would this reading of Mark's gospel go down at my church? Or you might be thinking, where's the role that I'm playing in Christian climate action coming up in St. Mark's gospel? Or is it not? So you could have a whole load of things, but sometimes it's, it helps you to listen in if you have a, have a question in your mind. I'm going to talk, um, and I think I'll talk straight through. Um, I'm, I will ask some questions as I go through, which you might want to note down. Um, and I will be making the notes available after the second session, which will be next Saturday. Okay, so let's go. And it won't be quite as fast as last time, I hope. So you'll be able to understand it a bit more. If you do want to ask anything, um, I think please save it for the um, for the end when I've stopped talking. And if you have, if you've got a problem like suddenly you can't hear me, um, maybe put an electronic hand up or message Jonathan and Jonathan might be able to sort things out for you, I hope. Okay, so Mark's gospel tells the story of the birth of a movement. It's the communication of a message and the sacrifices that are made by everyone involved. That's essentially what's happening in, in Mark's gospel. It's a, it's, a, it's a message that gets communicated and has consequences. And at the moment, we're on the brink of catastrophic and irreversible disaster with our po political and economic systems sending us headlong into climate and ecological breakdown. And people are coming together to challenge those systems and in so doing, breaking the law. That is to say, carrying out civil disobedience. And I have um, a um, definition of civil disobedience here. Civil disobedience is a symbolic or ritualistic violation, violation of the law rather than a rejection of the system as a whole. The civil disobedient finding legitimate avenues of change blocked or non-existent feels obligated by a higher extra legal principle to break some specific law. And I think that applies to Christians even more than other people maybe, certainly as much as. So there are parallels between these groups of people carrying out civil disobedience and the beginnings of the growth of the kingdom of God. So John Deere, when he spoke on Wednesday, uh, described Jesus as a one man crime wave walking into Jerusalem. And he also said everything Jesus did was illegal. So that's something to think of. So Jesus, John the Baptist and their disciples all challenged the oppressive Roman occupation under which they lived and also the legalistic inter interpretation and practice of Judaism, the religion they were bo both born into. They and others after them paid dearly for standing up for a higher law of love, justice, equality, forgiveness and all the other values that many of us take for granted as being right. So the following thoughts, what I'm going to come up with, are intended to help you to find practical help and encouragement for a life of civil disobedience, to which I think Jesus calls us. So we're going to see parallels between what we're doing in civil disobedience movements and the beginnings of the growth of the kingdom of God. We're going to learn how to be most effective at this moment and hopefully be prepared to for the necessary sacrifice. So here we go. First on the scene is John. He's the main speaker and he's the leader preaching repentance and forgiveness. And before we have hardly started, we have the first arrest. So only 14 verses into Mark, the leader is in prison for challenging the authorities and for speaking God's truth. And I think we forget that. I think we forget that what we do challenges the system so much that um, most systems, many systems, consider that worthy of putting us in prison. So being a Christian is not being a person who obeys cultural or societal laws, and it never was. So what do we learn from this? Speaking the truth, especially to people with power and money, is risky. 
Risk didn't hold John back. And he didn't end up in prison until Jesus was ready to take over. So there we go. Next up, Jesus. So as soon as he's been baptized and had some time to reflect and pray and to face up to what's coming ahead during the next 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus steps straight in with the same message, repent and believe the good news. So from this point on, everyone can see what the consequences might be from taking on a leading role, maybe even roles that aren't leading roles, because we've already got John in prison. So maybe our first question is about the message. What is the message that we're taking out in Christian climate action, in civil disobedience, just up or wherever? Is it no new oil and gas? Is it set stop Rosebank? Is it save our seas? Is it divest from fossil fuels? How important is that message? And is it worth dying for? Is it the right thing to do? And also, do we ask people to repent and believe? And if not, should we? So lots of questions, um, lots of questions that are, are coming up already. OK, so we've got we've John's done his bit largely. Jesus is on the scene. We're into mobilization. So after baptism and preparation in the wilderness, Jesus picks up the baton. Now, we all have our own conversion or realization moment when we realize just how bad the situation is. And that often involves a time of research and prayer and soul searching. You know, am I going to take this on? And this is essential prior to ta taking part in civil disobedience. So we see that um, that Jesus did that. And now also we're seeing that, that we're straight into a recruitment drive. So this work is not something that we do alone. Recruitment is part of any successful movement which leads to change. So first four recruits, all fishermen. What did they lose? They lost stability. They lost security. They lost connection with their families. So what might they gain? They gained community. They gained a new way of living and, and much more that they didn't know about at this stage. And why did they go with Jesus? I've always wondered that. I mean, it's always it's said so quickly, isn't it, in Mark? Why did they go? Did it seem right? Did it make sense? Was it just clearly true? Was Jesus just a really charismatic figure? We need to think about the answers to these questions because we want to be mobilizing people. We want more people to join us. So we need to think about, you know, the, the cost, uh, the gain, and also, you know, what actually tips people over to making action. Okay, so the message is then expanded. People need more detail. And Jesus spends a lot of time teaching in the synagogue um, and later in a private home. I'm not giving you all the references, but if you want to go through this, you know, we're, we're in Mark 1, coming into Mark 2 at the moment. Um, later again, just outside, that's in Mark 4. And lots of other times in the synagogue, in houses, wherever he was really on the way. And every type of person is recruited and debated with. So there are tax collectors, there are sinners, whoever they are, there are Pharisees, there are fishermen. And there were lots of different types of gatherings. So there was plain meetings, there was eating together, all sorts of different meetings. So our second thing to consider is mobilization. Are we drawing people in? And if so, who and how? How important is it to have a charismatic leader? And what will help them to see the truth? Okay, so moving swiftly on, authority. So as early as chapter one, verse 22, the question of authority comes up. Jesus taught them, it says, as one who has authority. And the re religious leaders questioned Jesus' authority to forgive the sins of the man who couldn't walk. Later, he passed on his authority to the 12 who were sent out to teach and have authority over unclean spirits. So how did Jesus respond when his authority was challenged? Well, sometimes he gave a sign. Sometimes he explained. Sometimes he just used his authority and left them guessing. What's our authority to tell the truth about climate breakdown? To challenge the government, to challenge the banks, to challenge the corporations. Where do we find that authority? 
So we have good news to share. We have a vision of the future we want to build, one of love, justice, humility and equity. And we don't shy away from bad news, such as the loss of species, lack of food security, mass migration, death, destruction, now spiraling out of control. We refer to our faith. Jesus told us to love one another. We're called to do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with our God. And Jesus is also the truth. And we have to tell the truth about the impact of our growth economy and our greed. So we have the authority of the scientific papers of the UN, of the IPCC, of the IEA. And we follow in the footsteps of one who did what is right, even when it broke the law. So are we sure of the authority on which we act? Do we claim God's authority? The command to love, to speak, to, to, to speak the truth. And can we refer back to that authority when challenged? OK, so that's authority. And now we're moving on to criticism. So in ch which we I think we've all experienced criticism within this work that we're doing. So in chapter two, uh, verse 23, the disciples are picking and eating corn on the Sabbath. How awful. And Jesus's response when challenged is the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In other words, let's focus on what matters here. Like, get a life. This can be our response to questions about our methods. It can also be our response to the law. The law is supposed to protect us, to prevent societal breakdown, to be good for society. And where it's not doing that, we have to challenge it. And we often get criticism from older and more established organizations like Friends of the Earth, um, like the National Trust, like our churches, for example, for saying that we're doing things in the wrong way. So when we're criticized, what is our get a life response? You know, what? how are we going to respond? Are we going to refer back to our authority that we have? Are we just going to say, well, look, just like, let's just get on with this. Tactics, which brings us neatly into tactics. So in chapter three, verses one to six, Jesus chose to heal a man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath. Why? That man had had that shriveled hand for years and one more day to wait would have been fine, really, wouldn't it? But no, Jesus pokes the hornet nest with significant consequences. So he does that. He knows that he's doing it. He knows that they much prefer him not to be doing that on the Sabbath. And we read in verse six, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So there's biblical precedent for poke, poking the hornet's nest. So how, how and when do we do that? Do we do it when we're talking about our motives in court, when we've been told not to, mentioning climate change or insulation? Do we do it when we're standing on the verge outside an oil depot? Do we do it when we choose to break, break an injunction or when we stay on the road rather than moving on? Do we do it when we slip it into the prayers that we're reading out on Sunday? Do we do it when we glue to something or we throw paint? Or other ways, in other ways, what all of those things poke the hornet's nest. And what kind of backlash do we get? Well, we know we get criticism. It starts a conversation. It gets in the media. It results in fines, community service, prison, loss of jobs. Is it worth it? Well. Of course, tactics, we won't ever all agree, but can we be supportive of each other? Can we focus on what matters? Can we support other actions and movements financially and with words and with prayers that maybe do things differently from us? And will we, like Jesus, poke the hornet's nest? Strategy, training, team building, these are all part of Jesus's campaign. So Jesus and his disciples can't get away from the crowds. Being very tired, not having a moment to yourself is part of the bargain, it seems. And I'm sure all of us have known that. You know, in, in chapter three, verse seven, there's, you know, it's like having the media spotlight. There are demands from all sides. Chapter three, verse 13, it's time to get up into the hills. 
to do some team building, to do some strategy thinking, to have the core team. Without this, the campaign can't go on. And so just a quick note here that if you're running a team, however small it is, are you making sure you get time to get away and think with them, with some perspective and plan what's next? Friends and family. So I'm sure you remember Jesus's family come after him and they, they want to talk to him. They want him to come out of what he's doing and talk to them. They're outside. They just don't get it. They say he's out of his mind. I mean, why don't the family get it? I guess the family don't get it because they're afraid or they're concerned for him. They can see where it's going. And maybe they haven't been part of it as well. I think it's quite different where your whole family is backing you and behind you and with you and out on the street with you to when there's, there's a difference within the family. So what is Jesus's response? So the way I see what Jesus says is they can be part of this, but this and these people is where my loyalty lies. So he doesn't exclude his family. He includes them. So it's not the only place that Jesus appears to challenge our family ties, but here you can really see it as inclusive and not exclusive. Everyone is part of his family. He can't water down what he does or says because of what his family are saying. So another question for you, is our attitude to our family and friends the same as Jesus's attitude? And if our loyalty is going to be to our friends in the movement, what does that mean for the depth of relationships and support we need to build between us? OK, so I referred back, I referred earlier to the fact that we need time to get away and people need to be sure of why they're doing what they're doing. And that's all about teaching and training. So in Mark 4, we're, we're only up to Mark 4 and we've already had so much. So in Mark 4, we have the parables. So as this movement grows, it's really important that people learn more and have more depth. So we need to skill up the next people. We need to make sure that everyone's on the same page. We need to encourage them and guide them. We need to build resistance. And that's for everyone. It's not just for the inner circle, but it's for the followers, the hangers on, no division. And so are we making sure that everyone is on message, that everyone understands how civil resistance works, that everyone knows what we're doing when we poke the hornet's nest, that everyone knows what a particular action is about, that everyone is supported. And I wonder if you have an example yourself, we may have a chance to talk about this later, of when this has worked well and when it's not worked well, when you've been able to make sure everybody understands and when there's been times when people haven't understood. Okay, so the 12 go out and then they come back again. They go into action just as we very often do and um, they take very little with us, with them. And this was this was difficult to, to imagine, I think, or always has been, you know, not taking anything extra with you, um, just being uh, reliant on, on people's hospitality. But I think we get a little bit of feeling of it when we go out without a phone. I think for some of us, having a phone with us means that we can get to places, we can contact people, uh, we can look things up. And when we go out on action without a phone, maybe that's a little bit of an understanding of what it's like. So they get clear instructions before they go out and Jesus gave them those. And when they get back, they get a debrief and we need to do that too. So people, when they go out on action, they need a really clear instruction. What are they doing it, doing? Why are they doing it? What will they say if they have to talk to someone about it? Uh, how will they be kept safe? Um, and when they get back, they really need a debrief. So that's all of those things. And Jesus did all of that. Okay, all of this is sounding very, very familiar, isn't it? We're now moving on to courts and prison. So, and we're back to John the Baptist in chapter six. There was no justice for John the Baptist. He had the most unfair trial there could have been. On the whim of a woman, with collaboration of her daughter, judgment by a man who didn't want to lose face, and punishment carried out by someone who just followed orders. John's role was really significant. We still remember him. He kicked the whole thing off. He was famous before Jesus was, and his role was over. 
So we know that John's disciples visited him, him in prison. We also know he was desperate to know if Jesus was actually the Messiah. So he needed that information. He needed that contact. Had he got it right or was he giving up his liberty for a total mistake? So the worst thing for someone in prison for civil disobedience is to think it's a waste, that it's achieved nothing, or worse still, that what we're fighting for isn't worth it. So we really need to keep them informed and encouraged. And when John was killed, his disciples took John's body and buried him. We hope that we're going to be able to give people a different kind of support when they come out of prison. But John's disciples didn't give up on him. So in what ways are we supporting people, preparing for court, preparing for prison, in prison and recovering after prison? All these things, we've got these examples in the Bible to help us. OK, and then we're into rest and recuperation. So more than once in this really brief account, we hear that they don't have time for themselves and they don't get time to eat. So in chapter six, verse 31, they try to head off to a solitary place, but it doesn't work. They have to keep going beyond what they thought they'd signed up for. And in chapter 40, and in verse 46, we see that Jesus needs time alone to, to pray. So I wonder how that's been for you. Have you had to push beyond what you, what you expected or what you felt you'd signed up for? How do you resource yourself? at that time and how can you plan for that time to get away to pray to be on your own or with others to rest and recuperate and are you able to get time alone and time to pray okay i've thrown a lot at you um i'm going to stop the recording in just a minute but before i do that i'm going to just say the three questions that i'm three areas that I'm going to suggest that people might want to go into groups for. So I'm going to ask people to think about what is my authority. I'm going to ask people to think about poking a hornet's nest, should we, and family and friends.